Welcome to This Old Town, Collector's Edition with Alan Orange. We'll be traveling back through Long Island history with some encore presentations of This Old Town segments. This time, the issue will be an explosive one. We'll take a look at Long Island's involvement in our country's wars. And that involvement has been extensive. This island has provided soldiers, spies, and secret weapons from the submarine to the supersonic bomber. Let's begin at the beginning of the country. During the Revolutionary War, the closest big battle was in Brooklyn. The British won and occupied Long Island. But small battles continued during that war, from Sag Harbor to Huntington, and none more memorable than those in Mastic. Neon lights up Mastic today, but muskets lit up the Mastic of old. From its quiet start to its fiery finish, the American Revolution touched every part of this old town. The start, of course, was the Declaration of Independence, and when New York State approved, slowly, conservatively, Mastic's William Floyd was a signer. For that, he and his family had to flee their home for seven years, as the British billeted their soldiers there and placed their horses where they were safest, in the house. The interior, restored much later, was trashed. Though to this day, one original window remains, with glass so distorted, courts of the day disallowed anything seen through it. As the war heated up, there were defeats, but few more poignant than that of Brigadier General Nathaniel Woodall, taken prisoner in Jamaica. He refused to intone, God save the king, and was slashed by sword and left to rot in a British prison ship. His wife pleaded with the British for a doctor, but he was left to die of his wounds, and soon the two remet in Mastic. But finally, the Patriots did triumph on the battlefield, including a daring raid on Fort St. George. Overlooking a strategic inlet and harbor, the fort and manor house were well fortified, but a spy smuggled out a map of the encampment, and Major Benjamin Talmadge led ten whale boats from Connecticut, then crossed the island along today's well-marked Talmadge Trail, and the rest is told by a painting in the manor house. At 4 a.m., they caught the enemy napping, literally, and after killing seven, Talmadge called for restraint, taking 54 prisoners and torching supply ships. One of his men, Sergeant Churchill, received the country's first Purple Heart from the country's first president, George Washington. So to say that Mastic was part of Revolutionary War history is really quite an understatement. The entire Revolutionary War cycle, from declaration to defeat to ultimate triumph, cycled through the history of the town of Mastic. But that was the side of the war that was seen with its cannons, commanders, and calls to arms. There was also an unseen side to the war, though, a revolution fought in silence by secret agents who warred with words. If General Washington needed information, he looked in, of all places, Setauket. There's a quiet charm to much of Setauket, yet sometimes silence can hide secrets, as it did here during the Revolutionary War. Those secrets will reveal themselves, though, if you stop and search this old town. Start at the local high school, and you'll find the spying that took place in Setauket proclaimed loudly in a lobby mural. But at the time, Austin Rowe, who owned Rowe's Tavern, would quietly leave the tavern room and ride to get messages from New York spies about the British. He gave them to whaling captain Caleb Brewster, and he took to ship by night and silently sailed to Connecticut and to Washington's camp. But there were other figures in this culper spy ring, each with code name and number. Robert Townsend of Oyster Bay, who wrote the messages in invisible ink, with codes for words like Tory and war. Unknown Agent 355, a New York socialite who bore Townsend's child, then died in captivity on a British prison ship. And most picturesque, Anna Strong of Setauket, who signaled the secret meeting spots by the number of hankies on her clothesline and signaled danger with a dark petticoat. A relative, Sylvia Strong of Setauket, sees Anna as a female role model. Uh, even though she was probably involved with a lot of uh, daily mundane things, that, uh, that uh, she still had the time and the creativity to uh, devise this method of, of uh, sending signals. And this Strong, it turns out, is also receiving signals of historic nature. For 107 years, her family has kept weather records for the country, checking temperatures, collecting and measuring rain and snow, and recording it all in journals on a table by the by where Washington ate. The weather tables look much the same as they did in 1885, when grandfather Sela Strong watched the weather. Speaking of weather, Setauket history started out rather cloudy. Spirings can be like that, but its public service was clear and crisp for decades after. 
so the country weathered its first storm, the War of Independence, with the aid of an occupied but hardly helpless Long Island. When we return, the war that turned American against American, even family member against family member, the Civil War and its Long Island legacy. Stay with us. For more Long Island history, here are some sites you can visit. The African American Museum focuses on the black experience and contribution. The Cradle of Aviation Museum features aircraft from the start of flight to the space age. Garvey's Point Museum is devoted to Long Island geology and prehistory. The Long Island Maritime Museum sails through sea history. Joseph Lloyd Manor is restored to its pre-revolutionary high style. The museums at Stony Brook feature a famed carriage and art collection. Old Bethpage Village has a score of historic buildings moved to that site. Old Westbury Gardens mixes Georgian architecture and English gardens. The Sag Harbor Whaling Museum returns to the tall ship days. Sagamore Hill was the summer White House of Theodore Roosevelt. The Vanderbilt Museum and Planetarium features the collections of William K. Vanderbilt. The William Floyd Estate is the birthplace of a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And the Walt Whitman House is the 19th century home of the good gray poet. We have been looking at Long Island during wartime, and one town is notable for major contributions not to one war, but to two. During the Civil War, it helped the fight on land. During World War I, it helped the fight beneath the sea. All of this from the small town of Southold. The lighthouse look is common around Southold, appropriate because many firsts have lit the way in this old town. For example, on this spot, Founders Landing, Southold began in 1640. That makes it, along with Southampton, the first English settlement on Long Island. Partly as a result, Southold also contains the first English cemetery in the state. And in the optimistically named God's Little Acre section, it contains tabletop monuments, raised slabs of early days. Also in early days, men like these fishing club members were responsible for one of the island's first industries. No, not fishing, but fertilizer, as they caught the Manhattan fish that abounded and spread them over the fields to enrich the soil. Fertilizer factories even sprang up to export the fish find. A little later, Southold proved to be first in war as well. In the Civil War, it was a leader among men, with an especially large number of re-enlistees and especially low number of deserters, according to war records. Just before World War I, another first. The first Navy submarine was developed here. One old building is all that remains of the subsite now, guarded by a boat of more modest dimensions. But when the prototype was in construction, the electric torpedo was a source of excitement, and especially so on its trial run with inventors hovering above. Five men fit into the cigar-shaped vessel, which dove 16 feet and shot three torpedoes. John Holland sank everything into the sub, called the Holland, and was asked to build five more. Another weapon was launched by this letter, the first atom bomb. The letter was sent by Albert Einstein, who vacationed in the area to President Roosevelt. And in this reproduction, it urges building the bomb to stop the Nazis. Einstein often shopped and chatted at Rothman's on the Main Street and played music in the Rothman's living room or just joined David Rothman on the beach. So Rothman's is the natural place to talk about Einstein, who actually put this country first in nuclear energy. In effect, it was just the last of many firsts in the 353-year history of Southold. And another town that's notable in two wars, this time World War I and II. Its story is a tale of two camps. One was an immense training camp for our soldiers, nothing unusual there. But the other was an immense training camp for enemy sympathizers, less expected, and certainly not expected in the farmlands of Yapank. The entrance to Yapank you'll find is at a crossroads, which is only appropriate, for when the world found itself at a crossroads, in both war and peace, it turned to the small town of Yapank. It turned to this old town. First, when World War I exploded, Uncle Sam needed Yapank as a major training center. The inductees first waged war on the forests and the mosquitoes, but finally they built a camp that doubled the population of Suffolk, and that became the 51st largest city in the country. At Camp Upton, the 77th Infantry, which was the fight in the bloody Battle of Argonne, learned hand-to-hand -hand combat from boxer Joe Lewis, and learned to relax from soldier-songwriter Irving Berlin, whose army musical Yip Yip Yapank 
popularized the bugle march heard here, oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. When the war ended, the camp was auctioned to the last nail, only to be rebuilt for World War II. But far more notorious was nearby Camp Siegfried, opened just before that war. Led by Fritz Kuhn at Reich, it was filled with Nazi sympathizers from the U.S. who took over a club in Yapank, a town with strong German origins. Both sexes and all ages snapped Heil Hitler and preached the master race, while trainloads of Long Islanders came to watch on weekends. The parade only stopped when Kuhn was jailed for larceny and forgery. At Upton, the barracks remained after the war along with the parade ground, but they became part of a great peacetime conversion to high tech. Upton became the Brookhaven Laboratory, a multidiscipline science center that's won four Nobel Prizes. And yet, its wartime history is preserved in a museum with objects like a German helmet nailed home and an object constantly found underfoot. Also, in the old rail spur that used to bring both men and materiel to this one-time crossroads of the world. First in war and first in peace, the old slogan goes. And Yapank, home of army camps and peacetime labs, might well claim that slogan. Now these days, by the way, the sight of Camp Siegfried seems much less ominous. It's a park. Speaking of ominous, Long Island filled the skies with some of the most potent planes of World War II. Some came from Republic aircraft in Farmingdale, but most of them came from a firm founded by a man named Grumman. Long before the recent merger headlines, Grumman was a name in the newsreels, and so was its home, Bethpage. The map you need to drive to this town is older than you think. Bethpage was named after a biblical town that was situated, like it was, between Jericho and Jerusalem, the original name of Wantaugh. So a much older town begat this old town. Long Island's Bethpage continued down history's path by creating a full village of 19th century buildings. Old Bethpage Village comes from all parts of the island, nearly 60 structures and still counting. Old buildings like Layton's General Store were rescued, though minus Layton. From Manhasset, Old District 6, came a one-room schoolhouse used when there was less to learn, only 11 presidents. From Plainview, the old church, site of many weddings since it was moved, and one history-minded bar mitzvah. And the one original resident, the Powell House, owned by the family who picked that name, Beth Page, from the Bible. On another large tract nearby stands a company that took off in the 30s and took along many Long Islanders. Leroy Grumman started making airplanes in a garage and at one time was the island's largest employer. He did it with plane models so famous they became toy models, all with names as wild as the Blue Yonder, Panther, Cougar, Hawkeye, Tomcat, down to the intruder that bombed Iraq. But two of the aircraft really soared. During World War II, the Hellcat, tested here, was the Navy's number one fighter plane. Grumman, helped by many Rosie the Riveters, stamped out 12,000 Hellcats, with a record 605 in March 1945 alone. In combat, its kill-to-loss ratio was a phenomenal 19 to 1. On a more tranquil spot, the Sea of Tranquility, Grumman later landed a lunar module. The final product was very different than proposed, with consideration of all types of landing gear, for example, to meet all types of possible conditions. But for Grumman, says a former base manager, the flight was heavenly. When the ascent happened, I think my heart stopped. So Bethpage history runs from the 34-star flag of the 19th century to a lunar flag for the 21st century. So there you have it. From the muskets of Mastic to the bombers of Bethpage, the island has been far from idle in times of war. Now, to explore that battle history a little further, we will be joined by Noel Gish, a lecturer on just that subject. After a break, the winds of war will pick up again. Stay with us, please. Here are places to look for more information on Long Island history. Not all of these books, videos, and periodicals are in current distribution, but all are available at local libraries.
Welcome back. We have been looking at Long Island during wartime, from the fighting that took place at home, the Revolutionary and Civil Wars, to the battles that were fought abroad, often with the world at war. To give us some added perspective on the subject, on the island's place in the broader battle plan, we are now joined by Noel Gish, who lectures on both Long Island and military history. Noel, let's begin with uh, a bit of strategy, if we can, strategy talk. Sure. Um, how important strategically was Long Island? I mean, apparently during the American Revolution, the British were intent on occupying it. During World War II, there was even a saboteur who landed in Amagansett, if I'm remembering right. Were we all that important? We have been important since the early part. In fact, uh, you started with the American Revolution, and that's very, very true. The British made a calculation to indeed take Long Island first uh, in the colonies. They thought that Long Island was an essential key to indeed not only holding New York City, uh, which was a major port, remember they'd been kicked out of Boston, and then using New York City to go up the Hudson to indeed take New York and to cut off the New England colonies from the southern colonies. So Long Island was critically important, not only because of its proximity to New York City, but also because it gave the British three things that they wanted, which was indeed food, a ready food supply, cordwood, uh, and indeed hay for indeed uh, horses, which the dragoons needed, obviously, to sort of kick around on the island. Mm -hmm. Let's stay with the, with the uh, revolution for a little bit longer. Uh, you know, normally when we talk about brother against brother, it's in relation to the Civil War. On the other hand, I guess the same could be said, and maybe even more so, for the Revolutionary War here on Long Island. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, just to cover the Civil War very, very quickly, the Civil War on Long Island was mainly Union-oriented. There was no doubt about that. Very, very little Southern support on the island. But during the Civil, uh, excuse me, during the Revolutionary War, um, you had the island pretty much broken up between one third of the island was in a rebellious state, uh, one third was neutral, just wanted to get their crops in, uh, and one third was loyalist, was interested in maintaining contact with the British. You had a great division among families uh, on the island. You had the Fanning family, you had the Hewlett family that was broken between older brothers and younger brothers. Uh, you had uh, a couple in Setauk at the Mursons, Mr. and Mrs. Murson, uh, who were on opposite sides, at least politically. Uh, some people in Setauk had said that uh, during the revolution, Mr. and Mrs. Murson didn't talk to each other. There are some people <laughs> that claim they didn't talk to each other before, before the revolution after. or after, <laughs> so the revolution had little to do with it. But the revolution did divide the island significantly. And, and one of the points that you can make on a national sense uh, is that uh, there was a British fort uh, in Huntington uh, that was built al along with a series of forts, Fort St. George and Fort Longo and then Fort, uh, Fort Franklin. And Fort Franklin was named for Benjamin Franklin's son, uh, who remained loyal to the British, uh, became the royal governor of New Jersey, and Franklin, obviously, an ardent supporter of the rebel cause. Yeah. So divided families. Divided really families nationally over. and on Long Island specifically, yes. Another thing I've noticed and people have pointed out to me is the prominence of women in the revolution. Uh, Woodhull's widow we talked about in one of the segments. Uh, if you look at the Setauket spy ring, uh, Anna Strong, the mysterious Agent 355. Is that correct? Was there that kind of prominence? And if so, why? Yes, there was. Women played a significant role in the American Revolution as they played a significant role in almost all aspects of, of Long Island life. All right up through to World War II, Rosie the Riveter applies to a lot of women on Long Island who went to work in defense industries. But uh, like any history, um, history has been mainly written by men and women have been outside of maybe uh, Betsy Ross and Molly Pitcher, uh, who brought water to the troops. Out of those, outside of those two, a lot of times the local stories got lost. Uh, and there was Anna Strong, her significant role in the clothesline uh, and the spy ring. Uh, there was also Mrs. Uh, William Smith, uh, who helped in uh, uh, getting the British out of Fort St. George on the South Shore, uh, actually aiding them. Uh, and when they were told that her house, which was inside the compound at Fort St. George, might be destroyed, uh, she was willing to do that. She said, the house goes as long as we can get rid of the damn British. Huh, interesting. Um, let's move to the Civil War uh, a little bit. And, I mean, the, the reasons for it are, are certainly many and, and complex, but the most prominent, the most visible was slavery. Did that apply to Long Island as well? How important was slavery here? Slavery uh, existed on Long Island, there's no doubt about it. In fact, it was brought here by the Dutch, the first slaves brought or imported indeed from Africa about 1626. Uh, in fact, uh, an odd footnote is that by 1700, 
uh, 15 percent of, uh, of Long Island's population was a black population and was a slave population, which was greater than indeed the black population of Virginia. The percentage-wise, Long Island had a greater black population. Um, as you move towards the, the American Revolution, you did have slaveholding families on Long Island, the Lloyd family from indeed Huntington. Um, remarkably, uh, William Floyd, again, uh, was the largest slave owner on Long Island, a uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence, yet a slave owner. Um, as you move up to the Civil War, however, slavery doesn't become the major issue. Um, remember, New York State had um, eliminated slavery by 1827. Uh, the manumission in New York State was complete. Um, so slaves, although they ex existed, were now very much a part of the free black community. And when you understand that in 1860, when you had the election, although Long Islanders, specifically Suffolk Countyites, voted for Lincoln, they voted against uh, at that time, a proposition on the New York State ballot that would have given blacks the right to vote. So manumission of, of slaves, although an issue in the Civil War, was not one of the things that united the island uh, in the Civil War. It was mainly holding the Union together. Mm -hmm. Let's move uh, to the uh, First and Second World Wars. And I guess first and foremost, many people would say, after taking a look at the, at the segments, is this odd Camp Siegfried. How in the world did we get a Nazi training camp in the middle of Long Island? I believe there was a Siegfried Express train coming yes. through the island delivering people to watch on Sunday afternoons. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did that flourish on Long Island? Um. One of the two of the best kept secrets on Long Island were one, Camp Siegfried, and the other, the activity of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Camp Siegfried emerges in the 1930s when there was really a national um, attitude of a, almost a pro Adolf Hitler movement. Uh, there were massive rallies uh, in Madison Square Garden that were in favor of Hitler taking Germany out of the Depression. Uh, he was anti communist at that stage of the game. He seemed to be pro Christian. There seemed to be a wasp identity that many people sort of addressed. Um, and on Long Island, uh, you had a large contingent of Germans uh, in places like Lindenhurst uh, and Sayville, um, and people who believed uh, that there was um, a reason to, for all blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, young people to attend a camp, uh, sort of an ethnic camp, um, got together, and it was sort of an extension of Adolf Hitler's uh, sort of fifth column. Uh, and Z Camp Siegfried emerges, um, headed indeed again in part by Fritz Kuhn, who was sort of the American one leader here, uh, and a fellow by the name of Walter Kapp, uh, who will be involved uh, in somewhat of the invasion of Long Island, is the way I like to call it, at Amagansett in 1942. But th they actively uh, took part in, uh, on Hitler Plaza and Hermann Goering Strasse and uh, uh, promoting the Nazi attitude uh, in Suffolk. No, we showed a lot of, uh, of military uh, hardware. This was almost a hardware headquarters. Um, we, we talked about uh, Grumman, for example, there's also Sikorsky, uh, many others. Mm -hmm. First of all, why was that the case and how dependent are we still on the island in, in that kind of military need and input? I think our defense uh, concept began very much in World War I. Uh, you had the Curtis plant uh, operating in Garden City. 95% uh, of the aircraft that we used in World War I was the Curtis Jenny and Glenn Curtis was the producer of that. As you move towards World War II, Long Island was uh, a very, very good aviation center. Uh, as far as topography was concerned, the south shore of Long Island was a nice flat plain. You could get planes off easily. Also, you, again, the attachment to New York City. It, you had the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Ships were being produced and loaded here. What better place to load ships with war material than, in fact, a place where you can produce them. And, and so I, therefore guess, I guess still to a degree even now. Most definitely. The Baldwin Naval Gun Works and obviously Grumman, which produced 95% of the aircraft in World War II and mm -hmm. Republic, uh, and indeed Gyrodyne and a few of the others, Sperry Gyro Company, were all very much a part of that. Good. I'm glad we brought it up to date. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Noel, for your perspective on, on war and on peace. Uh, our thanks to all of you for considering those subjects on this old town. And our thanks to those who helped create this old town collector's edition.